If you would open your Old Testaments to Genesis chapter 41, you would be in a great spot for the beginning of our study in the second session today. I do want to take the time I didn't have at the beginning to just share some thoughts of thanksgiving. It means a lot to get to be here. It's important to be able to get away from home and just meet Christians and experience the things that they're facing and to seek to encourage them and to be encouraged by them. So thank you for allowing me to be here. I want to thank the shepherds here. I haven't gotten to know them all yet, but Jason and I have been interacting a lot and it was good to meet him in person. Facebook's funny. I mean, I really feel like we've like shared birthdays together and gone, to, <laughs> gone on vacation. We really just know each other from social media, but uh, it is good to see you face to face or at least half your faces, which is the way it is at home too. But promise me we can all go outside and I can see you smile before you go. Can we do that? Can we go outside? We'll, we'll spread out. That'd be really great. Want to get to know you. Uh, love Sean, knew him from Beaumont. We already said a few things about that. The one thing members of the church hate is listening for minutes on end while preachers just pat each other on the back. So uh, Sean's okay. <laughs> Uh, this next thing may make him uncomfortable. I don't know. We didn't run this routine through, but I do know uh, I do know Ryan really well too. And I know you guys love Ryan. They just had a new baby. Uh, saw him at East Shelby recently, and so you've been really blessed with some great teachers. And I know that they've been happy with their time here with you. And so it means a lot to get to come and spend some time. And a very rare thing for me when out of state is Lord willing, please pray about this. On Wednesday, my wife is flying in. And she should be with us on Wednesday night. I really hope that she's able to do that. I want her to meet you. And we came last June to Phoenix. Uh, a couple times a year, we try to sneak away a little bit. We've got four kids. I guess we kind of have three now. One guy just got married. They still got it. They probably, we have four kids. But we have, okay, we have five, I guess. So, uh, but we tried to get away. And last uh, June, I think, even with all the COVID stuff, we flew into here. And of course, it was what, like 7,000 degrees? But it was, and we drove up to Sedona, and we just fell in love with Phoenix and Sedona. The whole thing is so great. So she's coming back so she can come be here with us, and then we're hopeful to head back to Sedona for a couple days at the end of the week. Uh, glad to be a part of Bible study with you, and we're in the book of Genesis for today. And what we're really studying, of course, is Jesus, but we're trying to show how wherever you go, wherever you're reading, there is a message of Christ for you, and that'll carry into some application over the next three nights, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I would say this about Bible reading in general. I asked if this was a Bible reading church this morning, and everybody was like, we are. And there are kind of three levels to that. You know, when you first read a text, you're just trying to learn what's there. Level one is just learning the facts and figures of the environment you're in. For instance, if this was a class and we were in the book of Genesis, which we are, and I ask all of our kids, you know, what's the book of Genesis about? They probably could give me a sequence of events. They would say, well, creation, Genesis 1 and 2, and the fall of man, sin, 3 through 5, and Noah and the ark, 6 through 10, and then A-I-J-J -J after that, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Like you start your first several times through just learning it. But then level two, level two is when you start to see you. Level two is when you're studying the same things again, except this time you're going like, what would I have done in the garden if the devil had said that to me? Or would I have spent 100 years, 150 years building a boat when I hadn't ever seen that before? Or what if I had to offer my son this morning, Genesis 22, what if I had to offer my own son on the altar, what would I do? Level two is great. It's a great way to study. And if you're not doing it, you need to be doing it. These studies are about you and your growth. But level three, I almost said y'all. Do we say y'all here? Level three is when you're seeing yourself, which we're actually going to do this morning because I think it's great, but then you start to see Jesus and you see him in all the stories and you start making notes of his presence and you start making notes of the prophecies and you start making notes of the precursors. And so we're going to do a couple of those today. We want to look for ourselves first because I think that's fine to do, but then I think it's going to be overshadowed at the end like we always are with things that relate to Jesus. So our study is the story of Joseph. That's where we want to be. I am fascinated by the story of Joseph for a whole bunch of reasons. You know, the book of Genesis covers hundreds and hundreds of years, so many years covered in the book of Genesis in the thousands of years. And one quarter of it is devoted to like 30 years. From chapter 37 through chapter 50, you get the story of one guy named Joseph. And if I asked you like, why? Why would you devote a quarter of Genesis to a guy's story named Joseph? You would say, well, Joseph's story is really important. And 
I guess it is, but why is it important? Like, why did the story of Joseph even have to happen? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why is it even here? If I asked you guys, well, why did the story of Joseph even have to happen? You'd say, well, it's obvious because there was going to be a famine and the people of Israel were small and scattered. And because of this famine, they were all going to die. But is your Bible open to Genesis 41 verse 25? Because it turns out there wasn't even going to be a famine until God decided to send one. In Genesis chapter 41, when Joseph was interpreting those dreams for Pharaoh, he, he said, God has told to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Joseph's story didn't have to happen because there didn't even have to be a famine. So why did God do that? What was this about? And it's more than just so our kids can learn about coats with lots of colors. There's a lot going on here. You might say, well, the better answer is because God was preserving a nation. I like that. I like where your head is at if that's what you're thinking. God was going to preserve this small nation and it was dangerous out there. And so the only way to preserve them was through Joseph's lengthy story so that they could get to the protection of Egypt. That is a great sounding answer and totally wrong, but really well done. Go back with me to Genesis 34. Like that's not even true. I mean, in Genesis 34, I get in verse 30 that because of some of the bad behavior of the boys, of Jacob's boys, that there were dangers about them. Like Genesis 34, verse 30, you brought trouble on me, he told them. And so you say, well, there you go. You need the whole story of Joseph to get them out of trouble. But I mean, look at chapter 35, verse 5. In chapter 35, 5, it says, as they journeyed, there was a great terror upon the cities, which was, or which were around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. They were fine. They could have easily grown out there away from Egypt just fine. God was totally taking care of them. So I want to know, what is this story about that takes up so much space? And I just want to talk to you a little bit about that today. I hope you find it interesting. Uh, I've talked to a couple of good friends working on this lesson, uh, several portions of it. Edwin Crozier is a friend of mine from Florida, and we worked a lot on this first part that I'm going to share with you, which is the idea of when you're studying the story of Joseph, you know, it's okay to look for you. And, and he helped me with that, and it went really well. And then a fellow named Ralph Walker was a big help on some of the things you're going to hear at the end. But I love studying with guys who, who can help me see things. And hopefully that's what you'll say when we're done here in, in just a few minutes. But, you know, I guess I would ask this. I would say, okay, the story's there for something. So let's start with this. How is Joseph's story valuable to you? And you know it, right? I, I, I don't need to walk all the way through it. You know that, that he was this, this boy, and he had these dreams, and his brothers threw him in a hole, and sold him into slavery and he ended up in jail and interpreted some dreams and and in the end he gets he gets restored to this great place of honor underneath pharaoh and he delivers all of his brothers I mean, everybody knows that story but what does that have to do with you and, and i think that it does and if that's the way you read scripture like what do i need to learn i think you're doing the right thing i want to give you four things to consider first of all when I read the story of Joseph, it makes me ask a question like this. I mean, you may word it differently or not feel the need to capitalize every word. I have lots of shortcomings in my life. <laughs> but how do I know, like, you ever ask this question? I mean, what is God's plan for me? I mean, we go through all this stuff. We've had the COVID stuff, and maybe some of you have had some economic things and some job losses or, or the sickness or suffered the loss of people that you love or or this political thing, and, and you, maybe you got really involved in that, and it didn't go the way you wanted it to, and you're wondering, you know, what is God's plan? Like, how do I know I live where God wants me to live? I live in Lindale, you guys live here. How do we know that's the right thing? And I don't want to start any fights today, but the person next to you that you chose to marry, how do you know if you chose the right one? Is, is that the one God wanted you to choose? Were you following God's plan for your life? Was he showing you signals and you ignored them? Okay, I'll stop now, but look, like, do you ever, I wonder about that a lot. Am I on the right track? Am I doing the right things? And, and look, we're not considering Jesus yet. We're just kind of in that level too. Like I know the story now. Now what's the story going to show me? And so when I think about this, there are a few things that come to mind. First of all, here's what we know. This won't take long. We know four things. We know that God did have a big plan. That Joseph was a little man, and in his little story, God had a huge plan. I want to take you to Genesis 12 mainly because we, we didn't get a chance to do that in the morning session. The morning session, we were looking at prophecies about Jesus in Scripture. Genesis 3, Genesis 12, Genesis 49. But in Genesis chapter 3, we learn that God has a huge plan for his nation. Verse 1, 
Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And then we have the, the three promises that we all learn. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curse you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And then in verse seven, I'll give you the land. So we know that there were three big promises. You're going to become a great nation. You're going to get great land. And then ultimately, Genesis 12, three, through you, this seed that defeats the devil will be born. Well, Joseph's story was a part of that. You can argue that it could have been done differently. You could always argue that. But that is the way that God chose to do it. And it's really neat when you get to the end of Genesis. Go to chapter 50. This was read for us earlier. When you get to the very end, it's kind of a eureka moment where Joseph understands that, wow, God was actually doing massive things through me. God was affecting whole nations through me. And he sees it in Genesis 50. And by the way, he uses it to keep us cool, which I think is a pretty neat takeaway point. He could have easily been very angry with his brothers. He had the power to completely squash them. But because he was thinking, man, I, th I think God's used me for something bigger than myself, he was able to have a better attitude. So you see that in verse 18, where they bow before him. This was read earlier. And Joseph comes back and says, don't be afraid. Am I in God's place? As for you, I know you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people here. Was Joseph's story a fun story, do you think? How much of the things that happened to Joseph over 20 years do you think he really just got a kick out of? That was exactly the way he drew it up. Very little of it. But he said, you know, what I learned is you wanted bad for me and you did bad to me. But God had a plan. And I believe that. Maybe we can argue that this week if you'd like. But I believe that God preserves every soul for some plan to his glory. I think you'll hear at the very end of the lesson what that glory is and the reason God has saved you and brought you here today. But I guarantee God's got something in the works with your name on it. But you need to be ready for something. He's probably not going to tell you about it. God's not going to come to you and say, let me tell you what I'm working on here. It's going to be bad before it gets better. I love how we tell people that. You know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. How do you know? How do you know if it's not going to get worse after it gets worse? Or if it's going to just be better all the time, like you don't know. God did not tell Joseph very much. Go back to the very beginning of the story in Genesis 37. This whole thing kicks off with this kid having these two dreams. Do you remember the dreams? Genesis 37, verse 5, Joseph had a dream, and boy, his brothers hated him for it. And one of them, you've got the sheaves bowing down, and you've got the stars bowing down, and like his brothers and his parents are bowing down to him. Now, if you're a 17-year-old kid, and you have two dreams that your brothers are all bowing down to you, what are you going to do next? You're going to go tell your brothers about your dream. And so he's telling them, I want you to notice that while that dream, those two dreams did kick off the entire sequence of events, it doesn't say that God told him they were visions. They're just dreams that he had. There's a really good chance that God knew that a kid couldn't handle the truth. And so instead, he just shows him something and sets him on a trail. He actually didn't tell him very much. I do think it's impressive, verse 11, that his father... His father's been around a little bit longer. He's a bit more mature. He knows more. He takes those dreams, verse 11, and he says, I think I'm going to tuck that away in my mind. I, there may be something to that. But again, there's no indication that God told him. What I find really interesting, if you'll go to 42, chapter 42, this reminds me so much of Job's buddies. You remember Job's buddies? Job's buddies knew exactly what was going on. They knew exactly why it was going on. And they knew exactly what Job needed to do about it. They were completely, entirely, unequivocally wrong in just about every assumption that they made from their base point onward. Well, what I find really interesting is, is in Joseph's story, God will get involved, but Joseph isn't told much. When he's in, in jail, he's not told that that's a good thing. When he's going through all these troubles, he's not told. But in chapter 42... Chapter 42 and around verse 21, it's interesting that later on his brothers, they think they know what's going on. This ought to be good. In Genesis 42 and verse 21, they said to one another, truly we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul and when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them saying, did I not tell you? Do not sin against the boy and you would not listen. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. Of course, they didn't know that, Jesus, that Joseph could hear them. But the point is, they think they're about to die as punishment, that God is punishing them for what they did. But that wasn't what was happening at all. In fact, the beauty of the story is they deserve to be punished for what they did. And at the end, Joseph just lets them go. 
So they're guessing. They think, oh, I know exactly why this is happening. They have no idea why it's happening. So I just need to give you that news, if that's okay. Some Texas guy flew in to tell you that very often you will not know what the plan is, and God probably is not going to tell you, most likely because you're not ready for that. But here's what's really beautiful about it. While God did get involved some, mainly all God did was he just used Joseph's faith. He didn't have to tell Joseph, okay, this next thing's important, Joseph. This next thing's going to happen at Potiphar's house when this woman comes in, takes hold of you. That's where I really need you to stand up. God didn't tell him any of that. He just relied on the faith of a man of God. And so you can see that in the passages. I've taken you to chapter 39. We obviously could look at at a whole bunch of these, but I, I chose the Potiphar's wife scene. In Genesis 39, verse 8, he refused when she propositioned him. Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in his house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Now, really, we could spend all day thinking about this. God's done nothing good for Joseph lately, by Joseph's estimation. He's in a situation where he doesn't even understand why his father hasn't come and gotten him. And yet God knows that no matter where you put this guy, it doesn't matter where you put him. You can keep him in the dark. You can stack the deck against him. This guy will honor me. And that's what made the story so good. The story's so good because even without knowledge, he's just acting in faith. There's a great little proverb here you can note later. By the way, we do have notes out for you. You can pick up all the notes for today, all the Bible references. But in Proverbs 22, it talks about this man. It says, you know, this man who's skilled in his work, like he gets to sit before kings and princes. You find a guy who just keeps his focus on God and does his, does his job, like focus on God and does his job. God can use that guy. Now, lastly here, I would say, and, and again, Edwin and I were working on this together and he developed this point really well that, you know, God did intervene at times. Sometimes Joseph knew he was intervening, and sometimes Joseph didn't know he was intervening, but you might be surprised with how few supernatural miracles happen here. You might think, well, Joseph's story worked out, God, uh, worked out well, but God was doing all these amazing things. Well, not necessarily so. There was definitely some of that. I mean, if you're in, in Genesis 39 with me and you're looking at verses 2 and 3, uh, this is where it says that Joseph is in Potiphar's house, and it says the Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper. I don't know if that was supernatural or not. I just know that God saw a good guy with a lot of faith who God was using and he blessed him. And you see that happening all along the way in verse 21 as well. Even after he gets thrown into jail, the Lord was with Joseph. Genesis 39, 21, an extended kindness to him and gave him favor. And you see that all the way through, and it reminds me of Romans 8, verse, that should be verse 28. Romans 8 and verse 28, where it says that all things work for good to those who serve God, to those who are committed to God. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be good in the moment. It doesn't mean you're always going to know what's going on or what God is doing. I mean, when you look at Joseph's story, if I said, tell me, was God working things for good in Joseph's story? What would you all say? Oh, yeah, definitely working things for good. Like when he was in jail, was that for good? Or or when he thought his father had abandoned him, was that for good? Or when he was was able to see his brothers, but he wasn't able to see Benjamin and he was tormented, was that good? You'd say, well, none of that was good. But God was working something great through all of that. And if Joseph hadn't gone through all of that, he couldn't have gotten that great result based on how God chose to do it. And so I would just say this. I, I want you to see, and we need to get to something of more importance, That level two Bible study is, okay, I know the story of Joseph now. Now, where am I in this thing? And what can I learn? And I think the lesson that I learn is, I don't know exactly what God is doing in my life. I believe I married the right person, by the way. You did say this is on live stream. (laughs) I married the right person. I'm just not sure that she did. That's legit. I'm pretty sure I live in the right place, but I could probably live somewhere else. Here's the point. You can torment yourself with, am I making the right choices? And if things are hard right now, does that mean I'm not making the right choices? Please don't. Please don't do that to yourself. God is working in your life. And he wants you to work by faith, which means he's not going to tell you much. But he's going to help you. And Joseph's story to me is a great revelation of that. But listen, you get a two for one today. 
This study can help us, and we'll bring it back to the end, but the, today's study is, is about something more. Have you noticed that while I was able, let me show you this again, I was able to use the events in Joseph's life and make connections to you. I hope that you were able to make those connections. You know, the truth is, if we really just sat here and read Genesis 37 through 50, most of it has no connection to you or me at all. Most of it are a series of odd things that happened and weird situations and dreams that got interpreted and famines and stuff that you and I would have to stretch this story super thin to make every chapter apply to you. Listen carefully. Every chapter of the Bible does not apply to your life, but every chapter of the Bible applies to the life of Jesus. That's what I want you to see. I want you to see that what's greater in this story is that I'm able to look for Jesus. Let me show you some details of this story for a minute. We're going to make a lengthy list here. And I just want you to see there are a lot of things that happen that have nothing to do with me at all. And while I'm giving you this list, I want you to see if you can figure out why this happened. Let me share with you some things. Here's how his story begins. Joseph was the favored son of his father. He was the one whom his father loved more than any others whom he had made. And early on in this favored son's life, he was given vision of an elevated future. He was given a vision of his own rule over even his own people. And when he told those visions to his family, they did not like it. His own countrymen, his own brothers by blood rejected him and attacked him out of jealousy because of those dreams. So angry were his brothers that a plot is formed to kill him, their own brother. They want to kill him. You know, Reuben comes in, has them toss him into a hole. He's hoping to help them escape later. Even Judah. Boy, Judah's an interesting guy. Judah is so interesting. He's got some ups. He's got some downs. He was a part of wanting to kill him. Now, he didn't die at that time, very interestingly, because Reuben stepped in. little credit to Reuben here that his own countrymen and brothers wanted to kill him and formed a plot, but he was released or at least sought to be released by the highest in command, which was his brother Reuben, who, who was going to release him, you remember, until he found out that he had been sold. And that's sad but he was sold away to Egypt for silver, 20 pieces in this case of silver along the way. And in order to appease the father who would wonder, where is my son, the son whom I love? They actually sacrificed a lamb. You can't make this stuff up. They sacrificed a lamb and offered the blood of the lamb to the father to explain what had happened. They brought that back, the boys did. Interestingly enough, and very counterintuitively, while Reuben sought to free him, he ultimately was sold into slavery and captivity, but he was spared from death by going to Egypt, which is very weird because Egypt brought the bad guys. And yet by being sent to Egypt, Egypt was the place where he was saved from his own flesh and blood. Isn't that interesting? I mean, what were the odds of that? What are the odds of some foreign nation being the savior of you? Early on, when he got to Egypt, we know that he was tempted. That he was tempted by Potiphar's wife and the own, his own uh, situation and the struggles of it. And yet, he faced those temptations with holiness. He was godly, even when all alone, facing the import of the devil's work. Open your Bibles with me to Genesis 39. Genesis 39 and verse 21. As he went through these trials, he was loved by God. He was overseen by the Father in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. Notice God didn't free him at that point. God needed him enslaved. He actually needed him subject to the rulers to carry out the plan. So he he loved him and he comforted him, but the cup, I'm giving it away, aren't I? The cup did not pass from him. While he was incarcerated, it's very interesting to me, the relation between Jesus and the two men in the jail. What are all these details about? These details don't have anything to do with Jason or me. 
These details are something else. They're saying something else. He meets two men, one of them a baker who makes bread and presents it to the king, and one of them the, the one who would handle the wine and the fruit of the vine, the cup bearer. And he relates to them both in their job, and he brings together the idea of the bread and the cup. And do you remember that the dreams that he was given concerning the bread and the cup and the two criminals is that one of them would be killed and the other would be released? And so we learn that the baker, three days later, was put to death, and the cupbearer, though they both deserved to die, the cupbearer was set free. And that's so interesting to me because neither of them knew that that was even a possibility. Go to chapter 41 and verse 14. After being in a place of incarceration with criminals, a place that Joseph didn't deserve to be, he was freed from that, but not just freed from it. Not just like, okay, you can go home now. He was elevated to second in command of the entire world. You know that Egypt was the world ruler at the time, and Pharaoh owned the whole joint. And what we learn in chapter 41 and in verse 14 is that his clothes were changed. They, uh, Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. That's also very interesting that he was probably pretty scraggly and looked like death but they cleaned him up and put these new white clothes on him and he's presented before Pharaoh. And ultimately in this text, he is exalted to the place at the right hand of Pharaoh. None are below, or all are below them and none are above them. In chapter 41 and in verse 43, yeah, maybe you saw this coming. As a result of the position that this man of faith who faced so many things in integrity as a result of the new position, everyone from all the lands are called to come and bow down to him. Look with me, please, in Genesis 41 and in verse 43. He had him ride in his second chariot and they proclaimed before him, bow the knee. And he set him over all the land of Egypt. Interestingly enough, a little bit later in chapter 50, his own brothers bow down to him. And then ultimately, even those, watch this, I think you're going to love it. Maybe you don't love it. Even outside of his own brothers, those of every nationality needed what he had to offer. And they came and they bowed down to Joseph. Everyone is called to bow down to him. The nation is blessed by his bread, by the bread that he had stored and kept so that when there was none left in the land and the famine of the world had taken it all away, they could come to one source of living bread in order to live. And then we read a little bit of it earlier, the whole plan, the whole thing, every step of the way was sent by God to preserve life. Go to chapter 45, please. Chapter 45. We read chapter 50 a lot and we'll do that one more time, but I want you to see the language here in Genesis chapter 45 and verse five. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive, to keep you alive, verse 7, by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. This language, and I think you know where we're going now, so I'll go ahead and say it officially. This is Jesus' story. This is Christ's story. This part we just read in Genesis 45 sounds a whole lot like God forgive them for they do not know what they do. They're putting me to death thinking that, that my death will serve their purpose and it will, but in none the way that they think. But the fact that by my victory, life will be preserved. And so when you read in chapter 50, you think of Jesus in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, and, and I mean, really, honestly, I'm going to go walk back through these because, I mean, I kind of got you trapped here for a few more minutes, so I'm going to do that. But even if I didn't, when you read Genesis 50 and verse 21, I mean, if that was red letter edition, would that be okay with you? Can you read this and hear our Savior speaking? Do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones 
So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. If I quoted that and said that's from Matthew 15, 4, would you be like, yeah, definitely. It sounds like it comes from the Gospels. So go back and look at this with me, and, and please turn your Bibles to John 6 as we get near the end of, of today's study. But, I mean, look back at this story. Jesus was the favored son of his father, given this prophecy from even the date of his birth that he would rule over the nations and his own brethren attacked him his own blood relatives against him his people they plotted to kill him they sought his death and his adulthood interesting it's an interesting connection there are a couple of neat ones one i, I didn't add that I'll, I'll add in a moment release sought by highest in command it's interesting when they wanted to kill him reuben was the highest in command and sought to free him and that's the role that Pilate played later Pilate's like the only guy who wants to free him, and he's the guy who's highest in command, but of course, it didn't work out that way. Sold for silver, 30 pieces of silver. He became, and this is so true of, of precursors. In, in precursor stories, there's usually some blood sacrifice that replaces the actual person. Like in Genesis 22, when Abram offered Isaac, Isaac didn't actually have to die. An animal shed the blood on his behalf. In this case, the blood that was presented to the father was the blood of a lamb, not the actual blood of Joseph. But with Jesus, there's never a replacement. Have you seen that? There's never some animal that steps in and he doesn't have to do it. Jesus' blood was offered. Very interesting as a child, by the way. He was spared from death by, by Herod and all of his own countrymen in the attack by traveling to Egypt. He was tempted all alone in the wilderness, and yet he walked away unscathed. He was loved by God. God sent an angel in Luke's account to comfort Jesus in his trials. He speaks of the bread and the fruit of the vine as two things connected in every possible way, his body and his blood. On the cross, one is they both deserve to die, both criminals incarcerated with Jesus. One of them shows a measure of faith and is delivered to paradise. One is not. He's brought forth to second in command. We know that for sure. He's brought forth to that. Everyone is called to bow to him. By the way, you're called to bow to him now. You don't have to if you don't want to, but one day everyone will. Romans 14, everyone will. Philippians 2, every single person will. And it doesn't have to be just his own. It can be people from any nation, which, by the way, is what we saw in Genesis 49 today. When we were reading about Judah and the prophecy, he didn't just say your own people. He said when Shiloh comes, everyone will be called to obedience in you. And he was put to that great position. If your Bible's in John 6, we can look at these last two things. The nation is blessed by his bread, except there's no substitute for Christ. There's never a substitute for Jesus Christ. And so the bread that he provides is himself, and the preservation is by taking in he and he alone. Are you in John chapter 6? We can read just a little bit if you'd like. In John 6, beginning in verse 48, I am the bread of life. Not that I saved it up and I'll give it to you. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, look at our last point. He will live forever. And the bread also, which I will give him for the life of the world, is my own flesh. Verse 54, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And again, he did all of this for people like us who put him to death. You meant it for evil. I feel like, I feel like sometimes when I'm journaling in the morning or writing prayers or thinking about Jesus, I can just hear Jesus telling me, Chris, you meant it for evil. The choices you've made, the sins you've committed, but I can make this story for good. If you'll understand that your sins put me to death, but I came back to life to save the very ones who sinned against me. And that's Sean, that's me, that's everybody here. This is a Jesus story. Now, that's all I'm going to get to do this week. At home, we did Exodus with the Passover lamb and Moses and all this, and we're going to do Leviticus. They think, I told them we're doing Leviticus when we get back. Everybody's like, oh, Leviticus? Like, who does Leviticus? <laughs> Beyond any letter you'll ever read in your whole life, the book of Leviticus is the Jesus story. The lamb and the priest. He serves it all. So, well, maybe if you check out LindaleChurchOfChrist.com, you can check that out later. But for the end of this, I want to give you a few things to think about. Last things to think about today. You guys have been great following along. And by the way, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, the theme will change just a little bit. We've seen Jesus. We know he's there. We proclaim his name. Now, what does he actually want to do in us? We're talking about drastic changes this week. Maybe not for you, but for me. But before we do, let me just give you this idea, and it will tie to Tuesday night. Really quick final thoughts. Story of Joseph, what's going on? Well, number one, 
God's scripture is all about Jesus. I've made this observation to you when we talked about this morning, John and Revelation, Genesis, Leviticus. But please do that. Please read scripture looking for Jesus because he's all there. But it's not just the scripture. God's plan in Joseph's events was showing Jesus to others. Have I convinced you of that? That the things that happened in Joseph's life, while never referenced in the New Testament, which is incredible to me, beyond any other event in history, tell you of the experiences of Jesus. But Joseph had no idea. He had no idea that he was the, the shadow of the Son of God. But I'm convinced that God was using his life to do some local stuff, but to show God's plan to others. And so remember what I asked you when we started this thing? I said, hey, what is God's plan for my life? Have I married the right person? Am I living in the right, per uh, in the right place? Am I working the right job? I mean, what, am I worshiping at the right church? Like, tell me whether I'm on the right track. Look, I don't know all the answers to that, and neither do you, but I know this. I know that everything God has ever done in Revelation is about sharing Jesus with people. I know that Moses' story and Noah's story and Joseph's and everybody from beginning to end is about showing you something about the Christ. So if you want to know what God's plan is for your life, it is to live Jesus and show him to the world. Whoever you're married to, whatever job you're working, whatever city you live in, and whatever happens next. The only way I can know that I am not aligned with what God wants in my life is if I'm not living by faith and I'm not spreading the name of Jesus. I love Acts 8. You know, Acts 8, they're scattering Christians everywhere. They just killed Stephen. Didn't get raised in the sense that Sean talked about today, but he got raised up to glory. But they're killing Stephen. They're chasing and All they did was went around preaching the word. Because even in the worst of times, and we have not experienced that, but even in the worst of times, the mission never changes. The word, the characters, and you have one job. To share the name of the life-giving Christ in everything that we do. Is that what you're doing? Is that why you're living? Is that what Mondays are for? Is that the life you've chosen in Him? If not, it's a simple invitation. Jesus is the answer to every problem that you have. And he is the light for every step that you take next. But you have to let him do that. How much more does God have to show us to lead people to the Son of God to be saved in him? If you're not a Christian, salvation comes in Christ and in Christ alone. If you need to obey the gospel and let his story live through you to the salvation of others, do so now as we stand and sing.